<laughs> I shouldn't say that. I'm very grateful. <laughs> Amen. We're going to get started into our study again in Matthew. People are saying, are you still there? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. I don't know where I'm going after we're done with Matthew. So. <laughs> Matthew 27, verse 59. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. This is the day of preparation. It's the day before the Sabbath. It's an important moment in their calendar because they have to get everything done on this day in order to celebrate the Sabbath. Can't do any work on the Sabbath. It has to be done prior to that. It was to be a time of focusing on their relationship with God. At least according to the law, that's how it was viewed. The Sabbath was actually to be a day devoted to God's work. The law said six days you shall do thy work. The seventh day belongs to the Lord. It was a day based on law. Law is, again, dealing with self-effort, self-righteousness, self-reliance, uh, self-defense, all of those things. According to law, the Sabbath was a day to stop doing things on your own without God and to spend some time with God. It was actually to be a time of relationship with God. And sadly then and even today, many people miss the point. To elaborate it a little bit further, we are so fixated on Sabbath as a particular day of the week, we have completely missed God's real purpose. Sabbath was never really intended to be a single day each week. It was a good way to institute the law, saying, guys, here's the deal. Six days work. On the seventh day, spend it with me. But God's intent has always been that we would spend every moment of every day with him. Sabbath is actually a lifestyle of walking with God. Not just for us, not just on a Sunday, for the Jews on, on Saturday. It wasn't to be just that day. Again, I, I say this a lot, and I say this a lot. <laughs> when Jesus says, I only do what my Father says for me to do, we must understand that that is the Sabbath lifestyle. Jesus never did anything according to his own accord. He walked with the Father all the time, doing the Father's business, walking in that loving relationship with God. That is what Sabbath is. Not just a day off of work. So even when, we're, when we are at our occupation, we're actually to be in Sabbath. Because in my occupation, I'm to be about what God sees, what God wants me doing, how he wants me ministering to people around me. That's Sabbath. So Jesus lived his entire life in Sabbath. It's the fact that God desires a relationship with us and designed us to have a relationship with us. That's the purpose of Sabbath. I mentioned it last week and I think the week before. Remember, in the Psalms it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So yes, we can come and have what we call the worship service where we focus our attention on who God is. But in order to actually live in Sabbath, we walk in that relationship with him, abiding and following the movement of the Spirit in our lives, worshiping him, 
by being obedient to his leading. That is Sabbath. Now, I go through that because it kind of sets the stage for what takes place next. A lot of people struggle with the idea of Sabbath because of the what ifs. Well, if I don't work, who's going to feed me? Blah, blah, blah. You know, who's going to put food on the table? Who's going to put clothes on my back? That's where we kind of come up with. But I have to go to work. I have to do these things. And it's like, yes, I understand. But also remember that for all of those what ifs, where we think it all depends upon us, God has given us our promises his promises to cover those areas. I put in the notes, Matthew 6, 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, there's that relationship, not law. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the Father and what he wants me doing. And whatever that is, wherever it takes me, Whatever cost is required, God will provide what I need. He will supply my clothing. He'll make sure that I have food. Not just for me, but for whoever I'm responsible for. God will take care of my household if I will walk with him. Now, as we move then through this section here in Matthew, Matthew is the only one who includes this next part. It takes place on the Sabbath. But I want to point out that Matthew doesn't use the term Sabbath. Let's read it and then I'll... Verse 62, bottom of page 1. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation. That's how Matthew writes it. On the next day that follows the day of preparation. That's how I know it's the Sabbath. But understand, to the Israelite, to the Jew, the Sabbath, according to God's law, is a high day. So what would compel Matthew not to use the term? Why would he avoid saying the Sabbath? Why instead would he say, on the next day, the day after the day of preparation? Why wouldn't he just say Sabbath? Why does he elude that term? I believe it's because what Matthew records isn't Sabbath as we've just talked about it. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, We remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. This conversation between the chief priests, the Pharisees, and Pilate is occurring on the Sabbath. That day in which, according to the law, they are supposed to be focused on God, God's will, God's righteousness. And they go to Pilate and they say, oh, by the way, we remember this guy said that on the third day he's coming back which they laughed at him for that earlier when he said it. But now they're concerned that just maybe something's going to happen. Also notice they call him the deceiver. An imposter, an imposter, a misleader. They are claiming that Jesus is misrepresenting and seducing people and leading them away from God. Now we know that's not true. 
And there's no evidence in Jesus' life that he has ever done that. But that's how they're functioning out of this. They want Jesus shut in that tomb. Now what's interesting is they only need him to stay in there till the third day. After the fourth day, they don't care. They just need to make sure that the words that he said don't get validated. They were doing everything they could, in essence, to keep people from believing that Jesus is the Messiah. It's no wonder that Jesus said to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. They need Jesus to stay in the tomb. I was thinking about different ways in which that's done today. People like to find some issue in the scriptures to say, well, because of that, you can't really believe the scriptures to be true. Everybody always wants to try and point out some contradiction or some error that then they use as their excuse for not believing any of it which is really just some weird justification not to let God dictate their lives. <laughs> These chief priests and Pharisees are doing the exact same thing. If we can keep Jesus in the tomb past the third day, then we don't have to listen to anything he's ever said. Verse 65, middle of page 2. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. <laughs> so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. They were granted permission by the earthly ruler of the land to go and do whatever humanly possible they could do to make sure Jesus stays in the tomb. So they went and they sealed the stone. Now, I don't know exactly how they did that. I have my own ideas of how I would have done it. Put mud or stuff around the, the gap, driven things into the rock on either side of it so that it can't be budged. Lots of things you could do to make sure that stone is really difficult to move. And then on top of it, they put a guard there to make sure that nobody can get to the stone in the first place to undo what they've done. So they have humanly accomplished everything possible to make sure Jesus stays in the tomb. It is, again, in its essence, simply human beings or the kingdom of darkness wanting to rule over the kingdom of God. to be in control. Instead of letting God's word control us to be in control of God's word. That's what's really going on. We know the principle though, right? Even though darkness appears to be rolling, all you have to do is flip on a switch. Then you really find out what kingdom has the power. Folks, this is why we have to view every circumstance through faith in what God has said or is in saying to us. We must view everything through what God has said or is currently saying. Because God's word is the word that rules supreme. No matter what anything looks like in the earthly realm. Because, again, I'm going to jump ahead here for just for a second, but understand, according to Revelation, things are going to get really bad in the earthly realm, and the appearance is going to be God's no longer in control. When, in fact, he is. We'll get to that. 
So the chief priests do their best to make it secure. In the process of doing that, I wonder if they thought about the parting of the Red Sea. I wondered if they thought about the parting of the Jordan River. I wonder if they thought about the walls of Jericho tumbling down. I wonder if they had forgotten about the earth trembling when God's presence showed up on Mount Sinai. I wondered if they pondered the Philistine statue of Dagon falling down two times in front of the Ark of the Covenant and the second time breaking into pieces. I wonder if they had thought at all about how many times Israel suffered because of unbelief. I wondered if they pondered the words of Jesus where he said, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you for a millstone to be tied around your neck and thrown into the sea in their process of trying to shut down and get rid of God's word, did they give any consideration to how futile their efforts really were? Before we just see the account, though, I think it's important to consider ourselves is my life pointing people to Jesus is my lifestyle is the way that I speak is the way that I behave the way that I respond to situations testifying that I believe Jesus is no longer in the tomb or maybe he's still there is how I live revealing that I'm trusting the promises of God to be the final outcome of the circumstance? Or is my life revealing that maybe I'm trusting in something else, that God's words aren't trustworthy? Does my prayer life, does my faith, when I'm seeking counsel, reveal that I believe Jesus is alive? God is present and active. Even more so, do our church services point people to God or do they exalt a man in human ability? Because that's what's going on here. Who wins out? God's word or human ability? And the question we have to periodically ask ourselves is, does how I live, how I speak, how I behave reveal my faith in the living God. <clears throat> Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I love that last part. Matthew 28, verse 1, page 3 of the notes. Notice what Matthew does now. Now, after the Sabbath. Oh, now he uses the term. See, I think he intentionally avoided it because the chief priests and the Pharisees were not operating in Sabbath. They weren't doing God's will. They weren't walking in a relationship with God. They were denying all of that. And I think that's why Matthew didn't put that term in there. But he uses it here because the situation is different. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So I started thinking about the comparison of 
human effort thinking that they can stop God's word from happening compared to the God who shakes the heavens and the earth. I love the fact that it wasn't even God who got off his throne and came down to earth and did it. He simply said an angel. Someone from his kingdom. Hey, you. <laughs> I got a job for you. No, not Gabriel. Not Michael. I don't need you guys for this one. Just you. Go down there and move that stone. By the way, shake the earth while you're in the process. <laughs> it reminds me of a conversation God had with Job. Job 38, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? God goes through this whole litany of things with Job and says, where were you when I put all this stuff together? Where were you when I put all the stars in space and I hold them where they are? Job, can you do that? How about your three friends? Can they do that? He also had a message through Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. To whom will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. So my thought to lead into verse 27 then is, based on the reality of who God is, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my just claim is passed over by my God. Now, again, we can do some substitutions there. Based on who God is, how come you think I'm not involved in your circumstance? Why do you cry out and say, where were you, God? He says, I was right there. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Page four of the notes. As far as the faith lesson from this, understand that there's nothing hidden from God's eyes. He knows precisely where we are and what we're going through. The chief priests and Pharisees were trying to stop God's plan from being fulfilled. And that same work takes place every day in people's lives. We have an enemy who's working to try and keep God's plan from becoming fulfilled in someone's life, in some circumstance. The enemy thinks he can derail God's plan. But he can't. He can't stop the word of God. On a much grander scale is Deuteronomy 7 and a text from Revelation where God talks about the beasts and he talks about one in particular that rises up in great power and authority that blasphemes the names of God that makes war against the saints and prevails against them. Yes, I talk about this a lot. Why? Because those days are coming.
And he intends to change times and seasons, according to Daniel. That's the same thing the chief priests and Pharisees are attempting to do at the tomb. They're trying to change times and seasons. They're trying to nullify God's word. And we have an enemy who does that every single day in people's lives, and he's doing it on a much bigger scale. And again, the appearance is going to be, when we get to Revelation, the appearance is going to be that he's succeeding at that. But again, Daniel goes on and says, but the court shall be seated. I don't do this very often, but say this with me. But the court shall be seated. Once more, but the court shall be seated. Yes. And God's plan is fulfilled. He takes the kingdom away from the beast and gives it to the saints of the Most High. He puts an end to the work of the enemy. In Revelation 13, where it begins to talk to us about Daniel 7 in its fulfillment, the beast rises up and he's got this great power. And the world marvels and follows the beast. And they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Again, understand the much smaller context. The chief priests and Pharisees have secured the stone and have set a guard and they've stood back and they said, and who is better than us to move that? Who has greater power and authority that they think they're going to move that stone and take that body? That's the miniaturized version of what's going to play out here at the end. Who is like the beast? But the court shall be seated. Who is like the beast? And God says, where were you when I created everything? Who is like the beast? All I have to do is send an angel. Oh, by the way, he does the same thing in Revelation. Bottom page four of the notes, Revelation 14. Beginning at verse seven. The prelude is, God sends another angel, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 19, so the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Again, folks, not God getting off his throne. Not Jesus. God sends an angel. I have a job for you to do. Go reap the earth of the wickedness and throw it in the great wine press. There's other places where an angel takes the lid off the bottomless pit, takes them, there you go. In Revelation 13 and Revelation 14, the same line is given to the saints. Here is the faith and the patience of the saints. No matter how bad things look, don't take your eyes off of God. Don't take your eyes off of his word and his promises. The enemy cannot nullify them. And understand, folks, the reality is that physical death is not the enemy winning. From an earthly viewpoint, that's how we view it. But it's not the case. Because, <laughs> uh, okay, Matthew 28, verse 5, page 5. The women had come to the tomb, but the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. 
He is not here. They did everything they could in human effort to keep Jesus in the tomb. But it was impossible. Because the word of God cannot be stopped. It's going to fulfill its purpose, Isaiah 55. We know that very well. Even if it's down to the 11th hour and 59 minutes, the word of God will be fulfilled. God's power is greater than anything we can fathom. And as we've learned from Jesus through the Gospels, God doesn't even have to be physically present like Jesus. All he has to do is speak the word. The angel says to them, come and see the place where, where he lay. Past tense. He was here. And oh, by the way, the day after the Sabbath, that's the third day. <laughs> God didn't wait till the fourth day. He did it on the third day, the very day the chief priests and Pharisees says, we can't let him out before then. God says, you can't stop my word. So as we know the word of God, and again, let me just emphasize this, as we know the word of God in the scriptures, but also the word of God given to us by the Spirit as he speaks to us, it's the combination of those two things, the word of God and the word of God spoken to us individually by the Spirit. That's what we stand on. Because those words can't be stopped. This story just lays out for us a glimpse of other things that there is no power like God. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You look at all the powers of the earthly realm, all of those kingdoms crumbled. At some point in time, they all crumbled down. There is no power like God. There's no human... It doesn't matter the number. There is no human grouping of people that can stand against God and say, we got you now. It's not going to happen. Remember when they went to arrest Jesus? And Jesus said, I'm the guy. What happened? Yeah, they all fell down, right? And just saying, I'm the guy. That's pretty scary. Whatever the Lord has said to you, whatever the Lord is saying to you, understand, the enemy will try to stop it, but it can't be stopped. We have to get past seeing things with our physical eyes and hearing things with our physical ears. Our faith must rest upon God and who he is and what he has said. That doesn't mean that every circumstance plays out the way I want it to. Okay? It's not, it's not okay, that means God's going to do things according to my will. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. That's how we want it to be, but that's not how it is. And understand, folks, we're going to run into situations where in that moment... God is saying something to us, and we're going to say, I don't want that. Number one, God's big enough for us to say, I don't want that. But what our faith has to do, though, is give way to it. God's big enough to say, that makes me angry, that hurts me, whatever. God's not offended by that. What he's offended by 
is one we completely reject. It may take us a little while to come around to it. But our faith ultimately has to find its rest in what he has said. Knowing that there's answers that I may not get now. There might be suffering that I go through that's very, very unpleasant. But God knows that too. But again, what's the end of the book say? There will be a moment in time where there's no more suffering. There's going to be a moment in time when there's no more tears. Right? So we have to look at everything he has said and keep those things in mind. Morning is but for a night. What comes in the morning? Joy comes in the morning. I'm grateful that the Lord is giving me pause because I was ready to simply run through to the resurrection. God said, no, 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 there's something here I want you to see. And it's an important part, I think. Because we're living in a day, especially, that culture, people that make rules, are trying to shut down the voice of God. And we just have to keep standing on it. Because God is also the one who says, I raise up kings and I take them down. I bring up kingdoms and I take them down. God's in control. Even when it comes to Daniel and Revelation, where God gives the enemy permission... And again, if we look at that and say, God, I don't understand why you would do that. Ask him then. God is the one who gives them control. And he says, but it's for a limited period of time. God is never out of control. And when the time comes to the end, the court is seated. And God corrects everything. Everybody okay? Keep our faith in him. You stand me this morning. Almighty God, your word is sure. We sang a lot of songs this morning that weren't designed around this message, but you put them together. You are the solid rock. You're the anchor who does not move. You're a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are. And Lord, it's easy often for little issues in the earth to make us forget. My Lord, I pray May we pay attention to the voice of the Spirit who wants to direct our attention back to you, who calls to mind the word and your promises. And also, Lord, I thank you for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who encourage, exhort each other to keep our eyes fixed on you. Father, thank you for your steadfastness, your faithfulness. And the mighty one that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.